start the recording. All right. And um, all right. So uh, welcome everyone to chapter four. Um, uh, or, or sorry, chapter three, our third meeting. Um, and I know, as I mentioned, there's a few folks here who uh, weren't here in the past couple of weeks. Um, but I'd like to start with uh, uh, those folks just introducing themselves and just saying a little bit about themselves and why they why they joined the uh, book club and then we can get started with the presentation. Um, so is anyone, anyone want to volunteer to go first? Uh, I can go. Uh, my name is Abby Vanderlinden. Uh, I'm uh, just about wrapping up a PhD in evolutionary biology in Western Massachusetts. And I uh, saw this posted in the Our Ladies Slack and thought it would be an awesome way to have some accountability as I actually try to try to learn some of this stuff. I've gotten very comfortable in sort of the kiddie pool of uh, the tidyverse and, and data wrangling and analysis, and I, it's definitely time for me to, to learn how to, uh, how, how ours actually working. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to, to learn from this group. Great. Uh, well, welcome. Thanks for joining, and uh, it's glad to have you. Um, all right, and then uh, I think uh, me, uh, Minashki, is that right? Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Hi Kevin, I'm Minakshi. Uh, I am a public health researcher working in air quality and environmental health. I'm in Taiwan right now and um, I just, I've been using R for data analysis, wrangling, regression, stuff like that. And I started reading this book on my own to learn how R works and just about um, then I found the, this posting for the club in Slack and I thought that would be a good way to um, keep keep going and not give up on this. It's been a little challenging because I don't have a software background. Um, so I'm looking forward to learn from this group. Great uh, thing and uh, welcome to you as well. Thanks for joining. Um, uh, it's great to have more um, folks in this group and um, and I and uh, yeah, so I believe that's it. I think everyone else was here the last couple of weeks. Um, all right, uh, before we get started with the presentation, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, with the GitHub, uh, if you're presenting or interested in presenting for the next, uh, you know, the coming weeks, uh, just be sure to submit a pull request uh, to uh, and edit and kind of put your name in the slot for chapter four or five or whichever chapter you'd like to do. And I can just share, I just want to share really quickly uh, what I mean. Um, all right. Can you all see my screen here? Um, so this is just the README uh, for the Advanced R Book Club GitHub. Um, but then yeah, the coming weeks we'll have, the upcoming weeks we'll have you know, a date with um, a chapter title. And so this is our Cohort to America section. And so if you're interested in presenting any of these weeks, I know we have someone for week four already, our uh, chapter four. Um, but if you're interested in five, six, seven, et cetera, please uh, feel free to put your name there. And then after the presentations are over, the, the person's name with uh, the cohort they were in, in the slides. And uh, I'll link, I'll be sure to update this so I can link the videos. Um, will be in this section. Okay. Um, all right. So let's, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's get started. Uh, uh, Varesh, uh, uh, do you want to take over? Yeah. Um, I think you might have to give me access to uh, enable screen share. Yeah, this happened last time. Sorry. One second. Uh, okay. Try now. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yep. I can see yep. it. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, uh, welcome to week three or chapter three of the advanced R book. So today we're going to discuss vectors and, um, so in this chapter, like Hadley basically discusses, um, types of vectors and basically um, 
some other stuff like uh, data frames, tables, that sort of stuff. So um, vectors um, generally uh, are like primarily are of two types, atomics, uh, atomic and list. And the difference between atomic and list is essentially the, um, in terms of the uh, types of the elements within them. So for example, um, in atomic vectors, um, the elements must have must all be of the same type, but for list elements um, within a single list can have uh, different types. Atomic vectors uh, themselves are, um, you know, there are four common types: um, integer, logical, double, and character. Um, you can see those four types um, on the screen. And Hadley also mentions two rare types of um, atomic vectors, raw and complex. Um, he doesn't really go into detail about raw because um, according to him, it's uh, not used, uh, it's not useful for statistics, but does go into um, like description of the um, complex um, type. Next um, is missing values. Um, so in R, we use NA to represent missing values. And if you see, um, there is a vector with um, two NAs and then two values. But um, if you use the double equal sign um, to check if um, check for missing values, it identifies that um, it's not um, it's missing and um, the description, I might be getting the sort of explanation wrong here, but uh, says that this is true because um, you don't know whether two missing values are the same. And um, in order to check for uh, missing values, we have to use the is.na um, function. So vectors can be tested, uh, the type of vectors can be tested using the um, is dot uh, function. And you can have like is logical, is integer, is double, is character that respectively check for like whether a vector is logical. You guys lose his audio. I can't, Varesh, I can't really hear you anymore. I think he's, I lost his audio and he's yeah, frozen. No audio. Yeah, cut out for me too. All right. Give me a second, please. Oh, oh he's back. You're good. Go ahead. So for atomic vectors, um, the type is a property of the entire vector because um, each element is each element of an atomic uh, vector is like has to be of the same type. So um, if an atomic vector um, is of the type integer, each, every element is um, in the atomic vector is also an integer. And uh, when attempting to combine different types of elements, they'll be coursed in a specific order. So it goes from character to double and then integer and then logical. So when coursing a character A and then integer one, um, both of those are converted um, into characters. And um, coercion sometimes happens automatically. So if you're or uh, coercing like um, logical um, values, so false and true, they automatically go into numeric, uh, false is zero and true is one. And um, we can also deliberately coerce values by using the as dot um, functions. Attributes, um, attributes can be added to atomic vectors to build data structures um, like arrays, matrices, fa factors, or date, date times. And um, you can use the ATTR function to individually set and retrieve attributes. So for example, I uh, created this example of a car with an attribute uh, manufacturer. So the attribute is individually set to Honda and then using the same function, we retrieve the attribute um, and then you can see the return um, value below. 
And using structure, we can set uh, multiple attributes at um, the same time and retrieving multiple attributes at the same time can be done by using attributes function. Names. Um, So um, in our, like, um, this is something that was actually like very interesting. So interesting and like um, naming. So there are multiple ways we can name um, vectors. So um, we can name vectors when initially creating it uh, or by assigning a character vector um, to, to names. And we can also, um, the third way to name, like name a vector is um, in line by doing this. Um, and we can also use the unname function to remove a name or uh, by assigning the null value to the uh, names. Dimensions, dimensions are um, an attributes, uh, attributes of vectors um, that allow it to be, behave like a two dimensional a matrix or a multi-dimensional array. And um, we can use, uh, we can create matrices by using the matrix function and uh, array functions or by using, um, by assigning dimensions to it. So this is a matrix that's been created with uh, two rows and three columns. And you can also create um, matrices by giving um, the row and column um, as a uh, dimension. And there were some unusual behaviors um, within um, the names. So for example, like vectors without a dimension are thought of as a single dimension, uh, are thought of having one dimensional while they are technically null. Um, this I thought was a little odd. Um, and matrices with uh, one row or one co uh, an, or column and one dimensional arrays print the same but behave differently. And um, using um, str uh, reveals the differences. Atomic vectors. Um, atomic vectors are. Um, objects that have um, the attribute of class and um, they're basically like it turns an object with a class attribute into an S3 object and this behaves differently from regular vectors. There are four types of um, important S3 vectors. So categorical data, um, which, um, which is like factor and it has a fixed set of levels or factors. Dates, um, and they're recorded um, as dates and date time. Um, there are multiple types of uh, date time vectors, but the main one or the primary one is POSIX CT um, and duration, which are stored in uh, different uh, diff time vectors. So factors um, contain predefined values. So vectors that contain predefined values are called factors and they're mainly used for categorical data. Um, so this is one of the um, atomic vectors. And um, here you can see that like uh, an example for using factors is um, 
you know, when classifying um, gender and it gives you, um, so creating a table of factors gives you the values of the fact, fa allows you to account for the factors that are within the data set, but also the ones that, are, uh, that aren't in the data set. So um, by using table um, sex factor, you can see that like it calculates three um, male values in the data set, but um, zero for female. And um, it also allows you to order, um, using a specified levels. So yeah, so a, uh, a is greater than B, which is greater than C. And um, many base R functions I think we lost you again. Uh, POSIX CT and duration are all built on double vectors. So the underlying values are all stored in the form of doubles. Um, dates, for example, so you can see type of date uh, is returns double and then um, the attribute uh, is date or at, attribute attribute, uh, they have class date, but no attributes. And the date times, um, there are two um, underlying types. So POSIX CT and POSIX LT. CT stands for calendar time and LT stands for local time. And POSIX CT is what Hadley focused us on in this book because it's the simplest. It's built on top of atomic vector and um, According to him, it is the most appropriate um, to use in a data frame. And the value is the value of POSIX CT is represented in the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. And um, when using the type of function, um, it gives you the value in um, double. And there is an additional attribute, um, or there's one attribute for um, date times, which is the time zone. And um, this does not, this only controls like how it's formatted, um, but not the representation. And one thing that I noticed was unusual was if the time is midnight, it actually doesn't print the time. Um, it just prints out the date and then the time zone. Duration, duration is, uh, duration represents like the amount of time between um, two dates or two daytime pairs and they're stored in um, diff times. And these are also built on top of doubles and have um, an attribute units that represent um, or that determine how the integer value should be interpreted. So for example, here, um, the units is weeks. So the, num the integer is represented or, um, or interpreted um, in terms of weeks. And yeah, there can, um, the units can be days or you know, any sort of seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, I guess. So lists, lists are, um, higher in the level of complexity from atomic vectors. Um, and um, they're different from atomic vectors in that and um, the elements inside of lists don't need to be of the same type. They can be of uh, various types and lists themselves can contain other lists. And the elements um, in the lists um, are all references. They're not the actual values themselves. And you can use C to combine several lists um, into one um, as shown below. And uh, creating lists can be done by using list, the list function. And because the um, lists are all, um, lists contain references to the objects, the sizes of lists are um, smaller um, than you would expect because they only contain the
main S3 vectors that are built on top of list, there are data frames and tibbles. And uh, primarily for data analysis in R, you're, um, you're mainly going to be using data frames and it contains a named list of vectors with attributes for column names, row names, and um, the class data frame. There's an additional constraint um, for data frames, um, which is different from a regular list, which is which is that um, the length of each vector in the data frame must be the same. This gives the data frames their rectangular structure, and uh, they also share, um, and this allows data frames to share the properties of matrices and lists. Tibble. Tibble shares the same structure of um, data frames and um, the class vectors are longer and the, in, in data frames the default behavior is that the string is factors is true so um, strings are uh, characters um, are order, um, automatically converted into factors um, but in tibbles they are not. Tibbles also discourage row frames and um, they offer a nice way to print. Um, towards the end of chapter three, um, there's sort of a different, um, you can see like um, the difference between um, data frames and uh, tibbles, how they're created, um, how they output information. And um, I really didn't go into that because it was so clear um, in the book. And finally, null values. Um, so null has a unique type. Um, and the length of null is zero and um, it doesn't contain any attributes. Um, you can use is null to check for um, null values. And um, there were two common uses of um, null values that were mentioned. One is to represent an empty vector. Um, so just using C and uh, not including any arguments, the uh, you get the null value. And uh, the second common use of uh, null is to represent absent vectors. And they're used when uh, used as default uh, function arguments when the function is optional. Um, and um, this is different from NA, which is used to indicate elements of vectors that are absent. And um, I thought this was uh, something interesting, which is that um, the SQL um, database um, null is actually equivalent to R's um, NA, but uh, not null. And um, that is it. All right, thanks, uh, Varesh. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, anyone want to start off with like questions or things that they've, you know, were on their mind when they're reading this chapter or anything that came up? Uh, thanks, Varesh. That was uh, that was interesting. Um, I I found it. Um, I, had, I thought there was more things about tibbles that were different, I guess was the first thing I thought about it. Uh, I hadn't really thought, I use data frames mostly because that's what I learned and then uh, I used to avoid changing code if I can do so. Um, and so I, I didn't realize there was so little that was different about them, which is one thing that I, I noticed. Um, I guess I was wondering if a lot of people use tibbles and find them to be much more useful, so I guess I could start changing my code over, but that was kind of the first thing that I was thinking about. Uh, I'll say that uh, I my default is tidyverse stuff, so I'll use tibbles, and the, I would say that what they describe as a cleaner printing uh, on the screen is to me sometimes an irritating printing style, and so I actually have to change an argument so I can see more of the table, or else I just use the view function and, and do the Excel thing of seeing the whole table myself. Yeah, I don't like the columns get cut off. There's like, I want to see all the columns. I don't care if it's like displays over. Okay, it's like I'll like use head and then see some of the rows, but I want to see all the columns. 
That's funny because I really like the. Oh, sorry, my. Yeah, is my uh, okay? I was gonna say I really like the printing of tibbles because uh, I like that it tells me the the vector type right at the top of it. I lose. I think sometimes I ha end up having a lot of mixed um, data frames, and I can lose track of what I'm actually dealing with. And so I find that the printing helpful. Although I do it, when the columns cut off, that is annoying for sure. I hack away if that was summary, so then I'm like I'm looking at the class and summary, and then I'm looking at like yeah, it, tibbles are definitely more efficient. There. I really liked how Varesh um, gave an example with the attributes because I've always had kind of a hard time understanding what that um, information is. And when you put in like, that's the car manufacturer and the data and the, the values of the car, and that's really made sense there. So that was good. That was a good example, Varesh. I have a question about the attributes. When I use reader and read in certain CSVs, I'm not sure what causes it to happen or not. Um, but I'll just get this huge list of uh, ATTRS. So when I look at it over in my environment, uh, if there's 10 columns, it, it'll show those 10 columns and then it'll show 10 attributes of saying it read it in as a text field or a date field or a numeric field. And I never know how to get rid of that because it takes up a lot of space in, on the side of my, of my environment pane. And it doesn't happen with all CSVs. So I know that it does a little work to guess the data type as it's reading it in. Um, but it, I find it really annoying and I can't, can't figure out how to make it go away. So I don't know if you guys have explored that. It just vomits attributes on you or what? Yeah, yeah, essentially. <laughs> Attribute vomit? <laughs> I, I think I can like, find a picture of it. And this is which uh, package is this wanna... for reading CSPs? What's that? Which package is this that you're reading CSPs with? Um, it's reader in the tidyverse, so read underscore CSV. Um, it makes it so that uh, strings as factors is is false by default, um, except I guess in the latest version of R 4.0, that gets flipped. I think that's the first, what, main victory for uh, tidyverse? Well, now that, now that I use the four cats, I'm all about the factors, so. Okay, it, yeah, it's been a journey, I guess. I, mean, I guess you can manually set the attributes, right? Like you could use uh, like attributes of some sort, or like ATTR, and then the object, and then maybe attributes. Can, can you do that in like a single step, though? Like I think uh, you have to read it in, and then go and set the attributes, and then like. Yeah, I'm guessing it. you have to make a function which is like list off all attributes, and then change all that attributes that you've listed, right? Like. What are the attributes of this thing? Now remove them all. Like you have to have some cleaning stuff, which it, it doesn't sound very fun. Yeah, I almost don't use it at all these these days. It's too annoying. Yeah, I've never had to use attributes myself. I, I guess it's for like if you're programming, like different like print. You want print to print out something in a different way. You can assign an attribute and do some funky stuff with like a switch. Yeah, I part of the day where I can use attributes tactically. Can you, I don't know if you can see that, but it just like lists them all out. So there's like my data and then all the attributes. So that's spec is the name of the attribute or, or spec like is the... Yeah, I don't, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess that's me. Yeah, because maybe then you can just remove, like you can change spec to something else and then it would, or like to null, and then it would remove it. That might be the way to stay with it. Um, yeah, I just use, re, I just use read.csv. <laughs> I use read.csv, so I can well. Yeah. I couldn't see it early. Was it, is it calling all of your columns in your CSV that you're reading in attributes? Yeah, there's something I... There's gotta be a setting for that, right? That can't be right. You would think I've spent, Every couple of months, I, I go down a rabbit hole looking. That's wild. I, I don't either. Maybe I've never seen that before. Or maybe I'm just not paying attention. I was going to say, I don't really. I mean, I guess I use attributes all the time, but I haven't thought deeply about them before. Like, I, if you'd asked me whether the names of a vector were attributes, I would have been like, uh, maybe. Um, but I'm now realizing, and this is kind of my first exposure to what 
the S these S3 objects actually are. And a lot of the, the packages that I do use, especially I'm now recognizing these attributes are things that are like important. So, you know, good, good light bulb moment for me. I think later on we learn about S3 objects and building our own. And because I think that's part of it is understanding like what type of, we can make our own types of objects and then there's like different functionality that you can offer towards those. So yeah. Um, I yeah, think I think it'll be really closer. useful to understand what the hell's happening with those. <laughs> yeah, what, what kind of packages are you using? Uh, I mean, a, a lot of stats packages. Off the top of my head, some of the like phylogenetic uh, comparative packages. Um, mostly, I only notice it when I run into problems, right? Where it's like, oh, this is, this is or is not an S3 object of whatever. Uh, so, yeah. I, Jake, are, are you willing to post uh, some code so we can try to reproduce what, what you're seeing? I, I just I just put a link in the oh thank you in the chat. Yeah, you can certainly like come out of that step and 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 change the the attributes, um, but nothing that just like does it all in one go. You you would think it'd be a setting um, as you were saying. Yeah, I'm wondering if like you can change spec to be null and it would get rid of it. But I don't really know. Yeah, that's what they recommend actually in the uh, in that mm -hmm. in that Stack Overflow post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you set attribute for that data frame for spec to null. Um, sorry, you to can't like, but you can't pipe it, right? Uh, it doesn't seem like I couldn't that. figure out how to pipe it. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can have a dot for DF and just have it right after your read, like a. It's hard to describe, but have like a yeah, the data frame that you're passing to attribute. Uh, I would guess that might work, but I don't know. But then you have to assign. I don't know. Uh, I, I can put it in the uh, the Slack channel. We don't have to spend a lot of time here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> doing it. Um, so for some reason we have like a minute left in this Zoom. Uh, last time it went like an hour and a half, 15 minutes and there was no issue. Um, so what I'm going to do is just put another, do backslash Zoom into the Slack channel and open another one. Are you guys cool? Just, uh, is everyone cool with just like re-entering? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry about that. I don't know why I, I'm, we're all still getting the hang of like, uh, yeah, the Zoom stuff, but I'll, uh, um, Post another one right now. Oh. All right, see you all in a second. Let me just start the recording again. Okay. Yeah, I think they had one person who had, and they'd always have to, have to, have to ask her to host. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Ozma, right? Yeah. 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 I just realized I've had a sponsored account the whole time I've been using Zoom because I did not realize you could run out of meeting time. So <laughs> uh, oh. not, not very many perks to being a student still, but I guess this is one of them. They got me a Zoom account for teaching. Awesome. I'm no pressure, but do you- Yeah, I was going to say I, I can- <laughs> Yeah, for the next meeting or something, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that for sure. Okay, all right. Thanks. Use use institutional resources for good. <laughs> yeah, I like that idea. Um, all right, uh, I think this is I think a couple more, more people maybe. Uh, we're here. We were we were at eleven, I think, in the other right. section. So I'm bad at keeping track of, of all this. So it's six people right now. Okay. Um. Uh, well, while we're waiting, uh, 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 Kevin, if I can ask, uh, what what are you using to set up your slide presentations? Are you doing those in Markdown? Me? Uh, I haven't set up any yet. Are, do you mean like the for week one? Uh, oh, you didn't? Did you pre who, who presented last week? I'm sorry. Gosh. Uh, yeah. So, so Mike, um, I used the R Markdown template that they have in the GitHub. But I mean, there's maybe a little more examples if you just pull down the markdown from my slides uh, or brushes. And then I honestly just hack away at that. And then I, I looked at the um, cohort one's chapter, I guess your chapter four, and look at that to see kind of different stuff on ideas. Um, okay. For how to present so, some of this stuff. 
we're, we're sticking with the plagiarism model for this group. I think, I mean, like, you know, building off of others, I think is the way I would describe it. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm all for it. <laughs> the template is in this uh, presentations folder um, okay. that I'm planning on using when I, but I have never used, uh, 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 I always have trouble pronouncing this, uh, Xerian? Xerian. Xerian? That's right, okay. Thank you. Um, and I also added something uh, via pull request, but I actually don't know where it ended up um, with like a guide or a kind of a, like a, yeah, I guess a guide for presenters uh, and different ideas and how to chunk up the session. Um, and that those, that slide template is also mentioned there. Um, but now I can't find it. Uh, so let's see. I think there was like another pull created or something. Um, Nope, that's not it. Anyway, I'll find it later. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look around. I um, I volunteered to do the next chapter and... Uh, oh, awesome, okay. Well, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a uh, um, a lot of learning how to, <laughs> to present it. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, please be patient, but I'll, I'll, in the next week, I'll try to hack together what I can. I had one question. Um, what was the justification for not using is numeric uh, and using is double instead? Is that just for specificity purposes? Or I was trying to read the help and it didn't really give me much in terms of why. And as someone who's used is numeric always, um, I get to know why. I, I'm not certain, but I, isn't. Wasn't there a part in the chapter that said that numeric covers more than just double? That that integer yeah. is called numeric also. Yeah. So I mean, I guess that could be it, right? So just to be specific, you should pick. You should make sure you're trying to get one or the other. But um, I guess I'm not too worried about. You know, usually I'm not that worried because it wasn't integer. It's me at first or double somewhere along the road. Yeah. Because most things are doubles, but. Um, yeah, maybe I guess that's that's why is that maybe I should just be using is double instead and it means most of the things. Sorry, Josh, what is that? Are you referring to like part of the chapter? Or? Yeah, in the chapter it says use is uh, double instead of is numeric. Oh, just as a general rule. Yeah. It says to avoid using is uh, is numeric. Could that also have to do with like types that are built on top of double or numeric? Like maybe um, it treats those types differently if you do, like a, you might get something that's undesirable. I don't know, I'm just thinking. Uh, sorry, that didn't make a lot of sense. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it and come back to that. Yeah, it was just, it was a exercise that says what precisely do is atomic, is numeric, is vector that's for. It. It's like, oh, I'm just guilty of using his numeric, so I'd, I'd like to know. Do, do you want to share your watch. screen so we can look at it together? Um, for which number is it? Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin, you have to um, enable screen sharing again. It's oh, 2.25. Oh, yeah. This is actually. Right. Oh, I think, should be okay. I think it has to do with uh, about the, the fact the things that are built on top of numerics. Because like I created a factor, and if I use s, if I use a spawn integer, it's true the factor is an integer. But if I use a spawn numeric, it's for it's false because the numeric is not a because the factor is not a numeric, it's just an integer. I see. So it's more specific to say to use integer or to use uh, double because integer would be correct for a factor, whereas. Um, yes, yeah, like integer is more. 
Yes, yes, integer is more general. So I think actually when you use like, usually what, what we really want is is dot numeric, is dot numeric, sorry. What we really want is is dot numeric because like if you want all the numeric uh, columns, for example, we don't want the integer, we don't want the factors. Right. So, it, so in that circumstance, we actually would prefer to use numeric. Yes. As long as it's just misleading us. Yes. Uh, as long as we have those exercises up, uh, yeah. uh, number three, uh, the last question, why is the word one up yeah. in this one three, four? Uh, can somebody help me with that? Um, my understanding was that one and, and two becomes a character, and I tested this with a bunch of different characters. And I think it's just that all characters cannot be, uh, like, can't be checked against each other for being larger or smaller because they have no magnitude. So it'll well, always come back false. If you flip the sign, one greater than two comes out true. With like this? Yeah. So if you try it in your console and just flip the sign, it comes out true. I think that's just how it sorts, right? Like uh, characters and then numbers, maybe. Well, is, is it like I is, think it's I think it's quote one and then is less than quote two. So if you were to like sort sort both of them, um, I'm gonna guess that they're gonna sort. Oh, uh, I see. The ordering is based on the things that just exist there, rather than. So, uh, but if you do, if you do one, quote one greater than quote two, it's still false. It is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and that's my, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Jake, are you saying that it's coercing two to the character two? Yes. And okay, that's All what right. I think is happening. I'm, I have to try. So it. Um, I'll, I'll share a different screen. So that can this up now. Too many instances of power open, so I'm sorry. Uh, they're saying, Jake, if we sort, if we um, were to sort these, one is going to come in front of two. That's that's my hypothesis. Uh, weirdly, it puts two in front of one. Um. And then what was the test? That oh, maybe do we need decreasing equals true? Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, one is of greater value than two in, in, in strings. And and because it's really like O, the O of one. Yeah, it's like letters and then numbers. Yeah. And, and do you know what, how the hierarchy for strings is determined? Is it ASCII values? It's a good question. I'm not sure. I know there's a rule though, <laughs> like punctuation somewhere in the mix. So now two is larger than one. Oh, I, if you, if you look, look in the help section for comparison, it talks a little about the, how the comparison in R is made. And it, it, and when it talks about the string, it's just like that it is surprising. Is how it describes. Yeah. Like comparison string is surprising. It's not very useful at all. Surprising sounds dangerous. Dangerous is what it sounds like. Yeah. Maybe this article. I'm not sure. So in our case, since O and like T are the first letters, the numbers came before. 
I'm going to change it from okay. number two to two with CWO. That changes it. I have um, a question for the group for when we're ready for a topic change. Yeah. Uh, has, uh, has anyone ever embedded a list or a matrix in a data frame? I was pretty surprised to see that that was an option. And, and I could see a list, wanting a list, um, but I've never done it or seen it happen. So I was interested to know if anybody has made use of that. We use it a lot at work. Um, we'll want to know what uh, the, we call it census in the hospital. I work at a children's hospital. And we want to know like uh, which kids were here on which days. So we just have their admit date and their discharge date and we want to like fill in the dates in between. So you can uh, use, you have to group by the group by the visit and then you can do list sequence, the start date to the end date. And then after you're done that group by, you just unnest that field and it makes one row for every day that they were here. It's really, really pretty helpful. Um, and the latest version of group by, you can do some cool stuff of like getting tibbles inside your set of columns. So if you want to get like the, the result of five num or box plot stats or something, you can get it so that it will make uh, each of those columns as a t tibble inside the column. So it's like a list column with a tibble inside. Yeah, there's some cool stuff. That's wild. That's yeah. Super cool. Yeah, it's like a, I'm going to post a, a link. Yeah, I've used the group by and then I'm listing before and then accidentally made matrices as uh, columns before, which has wreaked havoc. But that was mostly uh, pesky rather than, so I don't have as many uh, good versions or uses of it. I'm just wondering, is anyone in this group um, doing like biological data analysis, like using bioconductor packages? I guess not. I hear, I hear crickets. Okay. Do, do you use them? Yeah, and I was just going to mention that um, the, the default for many of them is to, to return a matrix. Um, I think it's because it's computationally uh, less greedy, um, less, less resource demanding. But so, so like you're doing like an analysis of uh, like transcriptomic data and you're mapping to a series of genes, you're getting a bunch of numbers back and then it makes the row names into the gene name. And, and the column names will be the sample or whatever, but then the row names are the gene name because it needs to put text outside of the matrix. And so one of the first things you end up having to do, if you're going to go into tidyverse or whatever, you have to, you know, uh, convert it to a table or something by um, row names, you know, being a column. I was just wondering if anybody else had encountered that, but if you're not doing that kind of, uh, of um, high throughput se sequencing stuff, then you wouldn't come across it. I've encountered that before, not with um, any kind of genomic data, although that's like on my list of stuff to, to get more familiar with and bioconductor in particular, but a lot of other packages I use. Um, I, I think, again, a lot of the phylogenetic stuff, you often have species or taxon, whatever you're using as the row name for the data frame. And then if you're going to try to do anything in the tidyverse with it, yeah, get, getting it into a column um, so that you can have it as, uh, as a piece of data rather than as something that gets lost. Because I think what has happened, what happens to me and probably every student that I've like taught 
to do uh, phylogenetics in R is the species is a row name on your, you know, matrix of data that you measured, and then it's a, a vector in your phylogenetic object. And if those row names disappear, then you just get random mapping of the traits across your tree. Yeah, and so then you're like, oh, shit, there's no pattern here. It's not what I wanted. And it's because you just randomly assign things because those row names got lost. Yeah, definitely. If you're doing biological data and you're coming from the tidyverse with your cute little box of tidyverse tools, you're going to see that the bioconductor packages are just like, what the, what the hell are you bringing in here? <laughs> you know? And uh, so, uh, and it is telling that most of the examples that we, uh, you know, we encounter when working with tidyverse uh, tutorials are more like real world kind of uh, coffee or beer or whatever. Uh, and then when you get into this, you know, messy, messy matrix, uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, I'm just going to have to use my tools and convert this to what I know. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, Chris, I think you also met, you said data frames, matrices uh, within a data frame, but also did you say lists? Um, so I've ever, I had the same question about data frames within data, a data frame column, but uh, I do have a lot of cases where lists are uh, values uh, in a data frame. Um, like uh, I get like outputs from like hot is uh, SQL, like hive SQL language. And if I'm getting like a, a array, it outputs like array of percentiles for a certain uh, variable. And then it'll come to come in as like this, basically like a list of, of percentile values at different bands for a certain variable and I have to like unnest it and do all kinds of stuff that surprisingly takes a while with that. Um, but that, that would be the only case I can think of. It seems like to me that if you have like a data frame as a column, it might be hard to use a lot of the tidyverse functions. Like, like I, I would get, it seems like they, like they assume that you're operating on, on, vectors, right? Like, I don't know, like, like, does it actually work well if you have that situation? Would the unnesting take, so I guess, I, yeah, I haven't used the nest or unnest stuff very much, but if you had, like, a data frame that was column, vector column, vector column, data frame column, and you unnest, does that give you vector, vector, and then the unnested data frame? Or, like, because they're not even, would it not I'm wondering if it'd be more useful if you had a data frame where every column was a data frame. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, you can yeah. do you, Sorry, you can do cool stuff of like uh, oh let me think. Well you, well, you can do stuff like mutate if, and then you can ask it if the thing is a list. Oh, and then you can tell it to unnest it. Um, that would make a lot. That would make it easier. Yep. Yeah, a lot of those if. If and at, those are those pretty powerful, yeah, powerful functions. I just put an example of how uh, how we use like uh, sequencing dates and then unnesting them in the chat. Interesting. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I just I guess a lot of the cases things like in the in the chapter I think they mentioned the like many models. Uh, example from like the R for data science book and I, I don't exactly remember the specifics of that example but um, but I I'm just imagining that you have like like uh, you know a column with a bunch of different models listed in a data frame and like I don't know a lot of the cases that I'm thinking of in this context like I would just do like a split apply apply combine type of thing um, it just, I, I don't know, I don't know why you would want to keep it as a data frame, I guess, like for if you had like a bunch of different models that you were kind of iterating through or something, I don't know, but. Yeah, whenever I've had multiple model sets iterating through, I usually kind of like store the models in a list object and then I call back mm -hmm. to them through that because I usually have some kind of set ordering for them or a way to reference back to the ordering. Um, Right, or like use per. What was that? Or so I was just gonna say, like using per or something with that list and yeah. like predicting or something from each each object. Uh, I think it's just so that you don't have to like stop your manipulation of the objects to go do that L apply 
and then like go back into it. You can just kind of keep going um, mm -hmm. by using per or something. So if you keep that list, that list column, you yeah. can use per to get what you need out of it. Yeah, I guess I see it. I see it with the lists columns, but with like data frames as a column, I don't know. I have more trouble imagining how that would work, but yeah. But it's almost like you can stop making loops. Like you could almost get that column to be your data frames and then get it to make a bunch of plots. I think you can even get like, I, I could be wrong, but I think you can get a plot in that in that column also. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's almost like just the one-stop shop of all the steps you're doing. Hmm. That's interesting. If I, remember, if I remember that correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we could like work on a example or something with uh with like data frame columns. Uh, Jake, thanks for the example. Sure. I think the questions are so tricky in his books. Like I almost tell people not to do the not to do the questions of R for data science because it you, you you're like oh I get this this is great like I can make a plot and then you're like I can't answer any of these questions I, I maybe don't understand. <laughs> um, yeah, they're tricky. So. I don't I don't have the same confidence with this book that I did with R for data science. Um, this this all feels really hard, but the questions are always extra. I think my main problem, at least in the start of this book, is I'm at the point of life now where I don't want to learn just for learning's sake. I want to learn what I need to do right now. And so if it's not relevant to something I'm doing right now, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not interested in spending that much time. And I know that, you know, there are other answers that I need to find. And it would be great if I could systematically go through this book and gain all the knowledge. But what I'm probably going to end up doing is flipping to chapter 14 and saying, okay, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's a slow simmer to some of this stuff because there's going to be things that we have to pull together, you know, from some of the first few chapters that end up be really enlightening later. I do think it's the kind of book where you can kind of come into it at different points and get what you need out of it. Um, I hear you. Well, I, I think I'm going to head out because I've got a lot of homework to do for next week's presentation. Uh, I better get started right away. And the dogs also want their dinner. So uh, see you all next week. Uh, so Abby, will you arrange the hosting for next week? Yeah, I can do that. Um, I'll just uh, I'll set up a meeting and drop the link in the Slack. Okay, great. Uh, are people wanting a presentation to be up well before uh, Thursday? You don't. You don't have to. I don't need that. No. I don't need that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on, on the name of our presenter today, but he had his deck up pretty early. I um, I don't think I put it oh. out early, but yeah, yeah I, I don't think I put it yet. Uh, I might have uploaded it to my, uh, the fork of um, my fork, but okay. I don't think I have submitted a pull request. Okay. And, and uh, uh, um, Kevin, because I'm I'm pretty dim when it comes to Git. By doing a pull request, am I cloning the entire repository locally, or what am I doing by pulling? Yeah. So so what I what I had to do was um, basically because the 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 this this repo is like not an organization; it's like a user. I had to fork it to my own GitHub first. Um, so and then clone it locally and then make whatever changes I wanted to make like commit those push those to my github my copy my fork copy and then do a pull request from there 
Okay, so what I should be doing, I, I don't, I assume I don't want much time between the pull request and the push or the commit because other users might be working on other things at the same time. Is that right? I mean, it'll, uh, like I did, so like when I did the pull request, it just, uh, it'll like say if there are conflicts and then you just have to resolve them. Um, but it does a pretty, I haven't done a ton of pull requests, but it seems to do a pretty good job of, of resolving those or like highlighting where those conflicts are. And then you just have to make like a few decisions to, uh, if, if that comes up. But um, yeah, that didn't come up when I did the pull request or anything like that. Um, but um, cause I, I, yeah, maybe someone correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you fork a repo, does that forked version keep up to date with the, the main repo that you forked from? You can rebase it. Oh, you can rebase. Oh, right, right. Okay. I don't know if it's rebasing or there's another word that starts with the RE, um, update from master. You can use that. Mm. But yeah, there, there's a way for you to keep it updated, okay. even though it's forked. I see. Okay. It should be pretty fine, though, because the only thing you're going to change are your own slides, which should have their own folder, and then the readme, right? So you shouldn't have too much to resolve in the end. Okay, I just don't want to break everything in my first... You won't, yeah, you won't break anything. You definitely won't break anything. Uh, like there's like yeah yeah I, I wouldn't worry about that um, but uh, but yeah let us know if you have any like trouble with that um, and we'll try to figure it out together. Uh, but, okay, if, if I do have problems, I'll I'll post them in the in the Slack channel. Um, awesome. And, uh, yeah, we can we can have a thread going. Cool, and I and I think the maintainers of the, the the folks who will review it are in that channel too, so they'll be able to Great. respond as well. Yeah. Great. Um, awesome. Okay, well, thanks for resolving my uh, issues, and the dogs really need to eat, so um, I'll check out. Uh, see you guys next week. Yeah. Take care, Mike. Thanks, everyone. All right. Talk to you later. I'll post this uh, video as soon as I can. Right. Have a good one. Peace. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.